Rights for Attention also sits in one of our strategic goals to enable more equity in open um, so that all those who wish to publish and share research uh, and education openly are enabled to do so. So um, we know that many countries over the last year in particular are seeking to provide an institutional um, supportive le legal framework um, to do so. Uh, thank you, Clara. Can we put it on slideshow? The slides? Does that work? Yes. Okay, so let's go to the agenda. So today's agenda, first of all, um, we've got John Treadway, who will present some of the preliminary findings of Project Retain, uh, part two um, of our work. And then we will shine a light on a few examples of countries who are actively working on rights retention policy making institutionally, uh, institutional um, rights retention. Um, and they all take different approaches, which really reflects the range of legal policy and support frameworks in Europe. Uh, we'll then have a panel discussion, which John will also manage. And then we then it's time for you with Q&A. Um, do feel free to put in those questions um, when our speakers uh, are um, going through their presentations um, or also for the panel. And we will manage that then later on. And then we'll have a, a short closing um, to remind you of, a, of the next steps. So next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Clara. So just a couple of words about Knowledge Rights 21. Um, it's run by the Stichting IFLA Foundation program supported by the Arcadia Foundation. Um, and the key mission is really to, we have a, a, a number of areas to focus on access to knowledge. We want to facilitate fair access to ebooks for users of public national educational research libraries. We want to protect users' rights under copyright le legislation from contract override and technological protection measures. Um, we're also promoting the case for the introduction of open and flexible copyright norms. And then there are two other areas and missions focusing particularly on open access, um, which is one is advocating for a legislated scholarly publication or secondly, secondary publishing right. Um, and then the area of focus for us, for Spark Europe, which we lead on, is the author rights retention work. So this is all to protect authors' rights um, going forward and to provide a better legal framework for that. Next slide, please. So um, just a couple of words on the RETAIN project and part two in particular. It's really to help accelerate the uptake of rights retention and open licensing to enable researchers to share their work openly um, and policy in particular. The second phase of project RETAIN is looking at, um, we are trying to understand much better the richness and the variety of different contexts. So by looking at 10 different countries, and we will show you um, some preliminary findings, and we have some of those countries with us who will share some of their journeys with you today. Um, and then we're continuing to campaign for more policy change, institutional policy change, and raise awareness of the positive effects of rights retention and open licensing. And we are um, building a European rights retention community of practice, which will uh, be launched at the beginning of December. We'll remind you of the date at the end, um, but that will be a place for you also to more regularly engage on this topic and not to just have to wait for um, a webinar now and again on the topic, so something more regular. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, let's get going with the actual program. I'd like to introduce you to John Treadway. He is the director of Great Northwood Consulting. Uh, we've had the pleasure of working with John at Spark Europe for several years. Um, so he is uh, the founder and director of that company. He has nearly 20 years experience in strategic and operational leadership roles and has extensive experience of strategy and policy development work with organizations around um, in the area of research and scholarly communication. 
Um, so over to you, John. We look forward to hearing about the preliminary findings with Retain2. Thank you very much, Vanessa. It is a pleasure to be here at another one of these webinars and to see, as you said, some familiar and less familiar names in the attendees list. So, uh, Kyle, would you mind going on to the next slide? So um, Vanessa's talked a little bit about um, KL21 and about Project Retain, but um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the research that we conducted in the two phases of the project. The first phase we began, I think it was just over two years ago, um, which was at a very an earlier stage in the development of rights retention policies in Europe. And our research in that phase was quite broad. We spoke to a very wide range of stakeholders, institutions, funders, publishers, umbrella bodies, organizations active in promoting it. We did lots of focus groups. Um, we surveyed a hundred odd institutions to understand what they were doing at the time. So we were really building a picture of the landscape and trying to highlight trends and understand how things were changing quite rapidly. Um, I was fond of saying, and Vanessa told me off at the time, that things were moving so quickly that as soon as we said anything in public or published any research, we just the one thing we knew was that it was out of date and wrong because what had changed in that period was so much, so much was changing so quickly. So um, we are now in a second phase and, and here as part of the development uh, of what's happened in Europe in the interim, there's lots more work going on tracking activity. So our focus is more depth. We're trying to build a greater level of understanding detail about the different approaches and the different rates of progress that we're seeing in different parts of Europe. And so we are developing, well, at least 10 case studies. We may end up doing um, 11 because the, the variety is so great. Case studies about the different approaches in different European countries. And the chart there shows you where we're working at present. Um, and this is through a range of interviews and reading documentation policies that are in place. Um, and, and working on those to accompany a report that we hope to publish will be early next year, I think. Clara, would you move on to the next slide? And, and the headlines that we find so far are perhaps not too surprising in some areas, but um, I will still talk about them. Um, the first thing to say is really with respect to rights retention policies adopted in research institutions, the UK and Norway were significantly further ahead two years ago, 18 months ago, when we published um, the first phase of research. And they remain the only two countries where policies are widespread among research institutions. We're going to hear in a little while from Sarah Thompson at York University in the UK. Um, and in the UK, the the pace of development was largely built on the work of the UK scholarly communications license um, and uh, librarians within Imperial College London, where legal advice sought by them uh, established that British copyright law would acknowledge an earlier license established by an institution if that institution could demonstrate that they had uh, made others aware in advance by publicizing their policies and notifying publishers that it existed. And so the approach followed by uh, Edinburgh very early on, Cambridge and other institutions following on, including York, uh, was doing that by establishing a policy and then notifying publishers and their own researchers about the policy's existence. Norway was slightly different. There they uh, was a collaborative initiative between universities to uh, establish a framework in which it's gone on. I don't want to talk in too much detail about that, but it's useful for the context in which Sarah will be talking later. Today, elsewhere, we see um, a focus on a combination of building foundations and advocacy around rights retention. So people are seeking to establish ways in which policy frameworks might evolve and emerge. Um, there's a combination of approaches that we see in the case studies we're focusing on. Many people are seeking legislative reform, seeking to establish a legal basis on which rights retention can be more easily established. Many people are operating under collaborative initiatives to across institutions or across different stakeholders. There is a significant amount of negotiation going on between um, proponents of rights retention and government or uh, other significant influences around funding or policy. Uh, there is a lot of uh, now, but some people have managed to achieve those changes, legislative change, or have an initiative in place. And so now the focus is on 
implementation or training and engagement of researchers to articulate to them why this is important and why there is value in retaining rights and in the frameworks that have been put in place. And um, I'm hopeful, having gone through those, that when Moitza and Ginevra talk later, some of those points will become clear in the case studies that they're talking about and the approaches taken to date in Italy and Slovenia. Um, the individuals leading the approaches are from many different stakeholders. Many of them are within institutions, research institutions, developing policy, but many are in other entities and working in other contexts. And so it is not just a simple case of individuals within institutions working to develop a policy. Um, and again, I think that will come clear from the case studies that we speak to um, earlier. And, and again, the final point here is even though we're talking about two years on, it remains very early stages for many of these initiatives. Clara, would you move to the next slide? Um, there is no recipe or simple set of steps that we can articulate to people to say, if you follow these steps, you will be able to develop a rights retention policy or it will be possible for institutions to introduce rights retention policies. But we can point to a number of factors in different countries that are affecting the uh, focus of reform and the focus of uh, initiatives to introduce rights retention policies. These broadly fall under the headlines of legislative environment, the national research policy environment and the research culture. So when I say the legislative environment, it generally means copyright and contract law and um, the different uh, elements of those. Sometimes there is legislation on scientific research and innovation. And within those different elements of legislation, uh, some countries have secondary publishing rights, which empower authors to retain some of their usage rights or secondary publishing obligations, which is a distinction that I think Anna Lazarova in Bulgaria has introduced. It may have been somewhere else, but that's where I've come across it, which is about how other stakeholders are um, made responsible for making publicly funded work available. Um, publishing infrastructure, by that I mean the nature of whether there are many university publishers, whether there are diamond open access publishers in the uh, country, the routes through which open access is achieved, by that I mean the presence of transformative agreements, or uh, the uh, use of inf uh, excuse me, uh, infrastructure around repositories and whether there is a culture of green open access and the freedom of academics to choose where to publish. Um, some countries have much stronger cultures are around this than others, particularly uh, in France. I know this where the copyright law is based around that principle and that affects very much the approach that people can take or the ability they have to introduce reform more easily. I'm aware that my time is coming up. So could you move on to the next slide, please, Clara? Um, this is called other points of note, but these are some, some significant points. Uh, we are, as I say, working on uh, 10 case studies. We have begun drafting those after conversations with people like Sue, uh, Sarah and Moitza and Ginevra and, and the work done. And we will be publishing a report um, later in the year, probably early next year, which is really trying to be a practical set of considerations and uh, steps for people who are thinking about establishing rights retention policies or thinking about how they can make it easy for institutions to establish rights retention policies, what they can do, uh, illuminated by those case studies about what people have done in other countries. I think it's worth saying, we, we know why people are pursuing rights retention policies and the benefits that they hope that they will be able to achieve. It is uncertain at this stage the extent to which they will realise those benefits because it is early. And I think, again, we will hear a bit from Sarah later about what, what York has seen in terms of um, progress since they introduced their uh, rights retention policy. Um, we see lots of different collaborative initiatives in place between different stakeholders. And it's clear that by collaborating, um, institutions and others are able to um, overcome nervousness or risk aversion among stakeholders who might be worried about um, being the first to adopt something or the first to do something. It's interesting, though, that in those collaborative initiatives, there's also an element of competition. By bringing people together and pushing forwards, nobody wants to be left behind. And there's a, an element of, oh, well, we'd better do it if they're doing it. So those, uh, it's a healthy combination of collaborating to make sure everybody has access to resources, but also uh, making sure everyone keeps up with each other. Um, 
a final point, uh, you know, the critical role of leadership and libraries in many places and the importance of engaging researchers are important points, but I'm conscious of time and would say the other thing I would draw a note to is, and I think we may hear about this from our speakers in a minute, is there is really not uh, a great deal of response to rights retention policies that have been introduced when UK institutions have written to publishers or people have written to publishers in other jurisdictions when their consultations have been carried out formally and openly, there has not been a significant response in most jurisdictions. Most um, institutions I have spoken to have introduced policies and surveyed the researchers and actively engaged them, have found it relatively easy to land the policy and have it introduced and people follow it. I know that's not the case everywhere, but I think I can openly and honestly say that to date, there has not been a strong or significant reaction in the places in which um, policies have been introduced or in which most policies have been, uh, most progress has been made. And at that point, I think I have finished and I will hand back to Vanessa to introduce the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chiwon. So um, now over to three examples from three different countries. Um, by chance, we've got somebody else from the UK starting us off, and that's Sarah Thompson, who's the Assistant Director of uh, Library, Archives and Learning Services at the University of York. Um, she has been responsible for content and open research, and her teams acquire and manage the library's information, resources and collections, and support York researchers to publish their work open access and develop other open research practices. So Sarah has strategic oversight of the library's content budget for both paywalled and open access content and is steering a gradual transition towards the latter, here, here. Uh, she's also active in a number of different networks, working in collaboration with other libraries, consortia, publishers and service providers to support the move to open access and open scholarship. So looking forward to hearing more from you, Sarah, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Vanessa. Um, so I'm just going to spend the next 10 minutes um, explaining how we've um, adopted rights retention at York. Um, and I wanted to start by um, really just talking a little bit about how having um, a shared goal and a collective approach um, across an established research partnership of eight universities helped us tackle um, this um, at my institution. Um, a whistle stop overview of the University of York. Um, we're not a massive university, we're sort of medium sized for the UK. And we haven't been going for all that many years. So we were established in the 1960s, very much true to our founding principles of being a university for public good. We have around 20,000 students across um, a large number of um, departments and schools and research centers. And importantly, and significantly for us in terms of um, trying to maintain um, resources to keep everybody happy. We have three really strong faculties in humanities, in social sciences and in science, and we are both teaching intensive and research intensive. So we have a lot of um, uh, different pulls. Um, one, one thing we do to, um, I think, really keep the library service forward looking is partner with others. The university itself is a member of various consortia and the library um, does partner um, very much with um, libraries in other consortia um, as well. So that. Sorry, brings... sorry, just one second. I just want to check. Yes, the slides are working. That's OK. I think we can move to the next one. Yeah. Thank you. So. We, as I mentioned, um, York is one of eight universities in the N8 Research um, Partnership. Uh, as the name implies, uh, uh, and the N refers to the, the north of England. So Manchester is the largest of, of us with, with over 45,000 students, um, and York's one of the smaller institutions in the partnership. Um, and the N8 exists to maximize the impact of, of the research base across all the universities, and promotes collaboration, um, establishing um, research capabilities and programs, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide, please. So the N8 launched its statement in support of rights retention in January, 2023. 
the statement was developed by the library directors and approved by research leaders and vice chancellors of each university. The consortium wide strategy is implemented through our local publications policy at each institution. Um, if you're interested to find out more, you can access uh, the, the statement um, and our consortium wide FAQs on the web page. Um, it, the web page also includes an infographic explaining how rights retention works, which is aimed at researchers. And um, there's videos on there of some of the N8 library leaders discussing rights retention strategies and so on. So that we went, we went with a little bit of a splash and it was covered in places like the Times Higher Education when it came out. Next slide, please. Just to briefly explain how we achieved policy change in this area um, at the University of York, that our research publications and open access policy had been in place for a number of years and it needed to be updated anyway. So we therefore took the opportunity to incorporate rights retention into this policy. Um, and at York, um, this means that staff members grant the university a non-exclusive license to make their manuscript open access and that this takes precedence over any subsequent agreement with the publisher, um, as John was highlighting earlier. Um, crucially, the university continues to grant staff the right to retain their own copyright to their research publications. Um, and when we introduced this policy change, we framed it in the context of our broad commitment to open research um, and the desire to make it easier for researchers to comply with open access requirements um, of both research funders and the National Research Excellence Framework, um, while still having the freedom to choose where to publish. Um, and our policy is opt out. Any opt outs must be made on a per article basis. Next slide, please. So we all worked to similar, but not exactly the same timelines um, across the N8. So, but this meant there was a lot that we could share with each other and use as a starting point to then adapt to our local circumstances. So for example, we didn't all have to go away and find out or publisher addresses that uh, we had, all the publishers we had to write to, we could share that and keep them up to date. Um, and I will acknowledge here that we didn't create this from scratch. We, in turn, borrowed from what the University of Edinburgh had done, who were the first in the UK um, to take this approach. So um, they shared their, their file of addresses with us. We used it um, and updated it um, as we came across changes and so on. Um, the letter templates were interesting. Um, this is the, the letters that were sent out to the publishers to notify them. Um, we sent those letters, each university sent their own. Um, they had to be framed in the context of the university's um, um, policies and reviewed by um, our legal experts. Not everybody has a legal team at their own university, um, however, so it was good for us to be able to kind of share and compare the wordings of the letters to the publishers um, so that they could then be adapted. Um, and we worked together on some a collective set of FAQs, but we were also able to, to share information about developing our own local FAQs. Um, the same for things like workloads and communication strategies. We, that we very openly shared the, those amongst ourselves and learned from each other and adapted them to, to our local situation. So we did gain a lot of reassurance from working together. We discussed how to for example, deal with any queries um, that we might have otherwise struggled with on our own from researchers and so on. Um, and so for us, it was hugely beneficial to work on this together. Um, and a national collection of resources um, around the rights of tension has since been created by GIST to support UK, UK universities with the adoption um, of rights retention policies, which is really welcome. Next slide, please. Uh, I won't dwell on this one too long, but just to say there is lots of information out there. And in particular, this, this is a really helpful uh, set of resources if you've not seen it. It monitors um, who's adopting rights retention policies at which institutions, gives a subject breakdown. Um, and it's quite heartening to see here that um, there are other consortia within the UK who are also now taking a collective approach and working together to introduce rights retention at each of their institutions also. Next slide, please. So at York, we've now had our policy um, uh, in operation for over 18 months. 
when we got to the one year point, we did some looking at the evidence of how the policy has been um, received by our researchers. We did a survey um, and we also looked at the data. The survey, um, we didn't get many responses from people, but everyone who did respond to how, um, the impact of the policy was very positive about it. We had no negative comments. Um, you'll see that the number of articles made available, made open access as a result of our policy is actually a relatively small number. It's only about three and a half percent of our total output. And that's really because the majority of our publications are, um, I guess, covered by read and publish agreements in particular. So, um, yeah, there hasn't been the need to, to um, rely on this policy to make articles open access until now at any rate. And we've had a very small number of opt-outs, only four. Um, so, and researchers are continuing to deposit their manuscripts at a similar rate to before the policy was introduced. And um, also of interest, no challenges were received from publishers either. So for us to date, it's been very positive. Um, next slide, please. I, I, just to give a little bit of data, um, additional data here about our number of articles published at York. So these figures are from 2023. Um, you'll see that the majority of open access articles um, are published on the hybrid route because we have so many uh, read and publish agreements. A significant number mm -hmm. are fully gold and the smaller portion there is of green. Um, so I think it's just noteworthy to note that our current dependency on hybrid um, gold to publish open access. Next slide, please. However, um, from next year, we are going to be ex exiting our main transformative agreements due to budget reductions. Um, and in most of those cases, we're going to be reverting to individual journal subscriptions to our mm -hmm. highest use titles. Um, so this means we will no longer have those agreements um, to facilitate publishing open access. And while we can, we're confident that we can mitigate the loss of read access um, to, to, the, to those portfolios of journals with things like document delivery, relying on our post-cancellation access rights um, and open access articles, um, we're aware of some... Um, it's a it's slightly more complicated picture um, for publishing. So we will continue to pay um, APCs in fully open access journals, and we will be making other articles open access in our institutional repository. But this will be a big change for our researchers. Um, we're not entirely sure how it's going to go down. So next slide, please. Um, what we do know is that the future is very uncertain. So the financial pressures facing um, universities in the UK are acute at the moment. This is not going to go away. It's not a short term problem. Um, we need more equitable and affordable models of scholarly publishing. Um, TAs are just not delivering transformation for us and they're not delivering um, a fully, up, you know, um, a scholarly publishing infrastructure that is um, that is transformative, that, that has moved on, is progressive. Um, many of you will have seen the GISC review of transitional agreements that came out earlier in the year, um, which concluded that the pace of change was, was too slow. For the biggest publishers, they are not transitioning their portfolios. In the UK, it found that um, despite many universities having these agreements, they still lock out a lot of um, different, um, different uh, researchers in different sectors who are not able to publish open access. So, so yeah, JISCA is currently um, considering the way forward for these sorts of agreements and is taking next year to do some work to establish a set of equity indicators with which we can um, um, assess future agreements from publishers. Um, and they're also looking very closely at the deals coming out from the big five publishers. Um, the intention is to try to move away from models that are purely based on article, um, numbers of articles published. And I just wanted to finish by 
you know, just adding to the uncertainty, what we are seeing is um, a, quite a worrying, um, I think, development. So as some publishers are currently trying to establish new business models for green open access and monetize um, the CC by license. And that's where I will stop because I'm aware I've run out of time, but uh, we can come back to some of these points, I'm sure, um, in the discussion later. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. There is quite some um, concerns there, but yes, I hope we can go into some of that further a little bit later. So now we go to Italy, to Ginevra Peruginelli. Um, so Ginevra is a senior uh, uh, researcher at the Institute of Legal I Informatics and Judicial Systems of the National Research Council of Italy. Her work focuses on copyright law, open access and digital scholarly communications. She works on fostering open access policies in Italy, addressing gaps in current legislation and promoting sustainable publishing models aligned with international frameworks. She's participating in several European and international projects on open science and in particular on free access to law. And she is the author of many scientific works and editor of books on ICT and legal information. Over to you, Ginevra. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon to all. And thank you to Spark Europe for the invitation. Uh, today, I would like to give you a short overview of what is happening uh, in Italy, particularly at the National Research Council where I work, which is also the context in which uh, the project Right to Pub is located. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the project names itself highlights uh, its focus on a bottom-up approach to the topic of managing authors' rights and advancing open science. So the subtitle is The Voice of Research Community on Rights Retention Secondary Publication Rights. So to stress uh, that managing copyright is uh, first of all an issue that involves knowledge creators, which are namely the authors. Uh, the project uh, was financed by Knowledge Rights 21 and has lasted one year and is carried out by my institute in collaboration with uh, the library in uh, Bologna and the scientific center in Pisa, the Creative Commons National Chapter and the National Coordinator of Knowledge Rights 21 for Italy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the initiative um, operates within the fragmented Italian publishing landscape, uh, which is shaped uh, uh, within a complex and fragile legal framework. Um, so without detailing specific provision, uh, we can say that the public entities funding scientific research are required to ensure that the results from research funding by at least 55% of public funds are made publicly accessible. But in practice, in Italy, there are some significant challenges to achieve open access. So, uh, and these challenges include uh, contractual waivers, numerous limitations, uh, insufficient enforcement mechanism, even in cases where open access obligations are formally imposed. And in, additionally, the research quality call does not include the stringent requirements uh, uh, for researchers to publish in open access, and these uh, uh, not offer clear directive to promote uh, this practice. Of course, there is a national plan for open science, which includes promoting uh, an inalienable and immediate right of uh, republication without embargo and there are also some uh, efforts uh, legislative efforts uh, with bill proposal but of course this initiative failed to advance so this structural fragmentation and lack of uh, action highlight the challenges Italy face uh, compared to the more robust uh, frameworks emerging across Europe next slide please so it is in this context that the project, the Right to Pub project is positioned, aiming to support the secondary publication right at the national level, raise awareness among researchers about retaining their rights, and address the limitation of current uh, legislation, which uh, does not grant authors the right to republish their work. Next slide, please. 
so we have uh, structured the initiative in two, three phases. The first phase is focused on serving, analyzing the National Research Council research community awareness of managing author rights. The second phase involves the creation of a dedicated space with training resources and informational tools. And the third phase, which is the most ambitious one, is focused on pushing for legislative changes uh, in institutional policies regarding copyright management. Uh, next slide, please. So for the phase phase, we have sent uh, a well-structured questionnaire composed by 26 questions to around 6,000 CNR researchers. The response rate was uh, uh, 13%. Uh, uh, and although it might seem low, uh, it provides significant insight into authors' awareness of publishing rights. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I, I just um, give you some, some data. In Italy, both publications are behind paywalls with gold open access coming in second. Green and hybrid open access are also used, while diamond open access is uh, the least common. So the, the Italian publishing landscape reflects uh, a balance uh, uh, between uh, growing support to open access and the strong influence of commercial publishers who dominate through gold and hybrid open access models. Uh, there are, of course, university presses that prefer the diamond open access, but uh, this is usually limited to their own scholars. And uh, with uh, its uh, limited impact, uh, primarily due also to the lack of public funding on this, uh, on this matter. Uh, next slide. Uh, regarding licenses, the data of the questionnaire shows a limited understanding of Creative Commons. Most respondents are uns unsure uh, of the differences between licenses and their specific features. And uh, surprisingly, the second most common response was the CC0 public domain license, indicating uh, for 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 the team of the project, a significant misunderstanding as it involves a complete waiver of uh, author rights. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, when we look into the practice of republication, uh, we found that uh, fifty five percent of respondents answered no to the question: When you publish your work, do you worry about verifying which rights you retain? So this suggests that many don't check which rights they have after publication. However, uh, for those who do pay attention, uh, seventy six percent said they review the contractual clauses to understand the conditions. So additionally, sixty percent mentioned that they avoid publishing with a particular publisher if the terms are not favorable. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here I, um, I listed some free text responses that I think are relevant to stress the lack of awareness uh, and sensitivity towards these issues and maybe in some cases the complete ignorance of the subject. For instance, one respondent uh, simply wrote, I only know that publishing means transferring rights, uh, while another stated that the only concern is... Uh, uh, how many complementary copies I'm entitled to. So these responses clearly uh, highlight the, the, the urgent need for more education and awareness on these important topics. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also looked into whether the scientific community of the National Research Council is aware of what's happening in other countries. So the majority of respondents don't know that some countries uh, have the a right to republish scientific work. Uh, they aren't, far, aren't familiar with the right retention strategy by coalition else. And uh, also, while uh, this might seem as outside the scope, it's actually important to notice that the large majority don't, don't understand uh, the difference and they don't know the difference between the version of record and the author accepted manuscript. Uh, however, there is uh, some uh, positive, positive news as respondents support laws uh, that allow immediate uh, open access for publication and are also interested for training uh, on publishing and copyright. Uh, next slide, please. So if you are interested in uh, the detailed analysis of all these questions, we have published two reports, one in Italian and one in English, and they are available on Zenodo. So you are free to check them out if you are interested. Uh, next slide. Uh, in the second phase, we have developed a dedicated websites and we have collected the new informative resources.
And we have also uh, organized two important informational events uh, in Pisa and in Bologna with researchers and with the uh, founders and staff from uh, the Open Science Office. We have seen great success and interest from researchers, in particular from those who are uh, journal editors, uh, journal directors. However, uh, the topic of assessment remains a delicate and underlying issue. Uh, next slide, please. The third phase, which is the most ambitious, as I said, uh, focus on advocacy and is currently well underway. We have developed a comprehensive approach to build uh, a broad network of experts uh, and create a clear practical guide for researchers and also to produce a scientific book. We, we said a book manifesto uh, featuring top voices, including copyright experts, librarians, uh, publishers and founders who work uh, with these uh, issues regularly. Uh, next slides. This is the practical guide. I can show you also here in, in print. And uh, it consists of explanatory sheets that outline step-by-step -step, uh, uh, instruction on how to retain their rights, what action to take when signing a contract with a publisher, how to navigate different licensing options, and also explain how and what to deposit in institutional or disciplinary repository. Next slide, please. And then we have published a book manifesto released uh, in October 20, 2024 in open access. And uh, this book brings together contribution not only from Italian uh, experts, but also from international voices, including experience from abroad, the Netherlands and Bulgaria. Uh, next slide, please. Then we have carried out dissemination activities. These are the three most important, in particular, the ones uh, in, at the Senate House in June it was uh, significant both because of the venue, of course, but also uh, due, for, due to the feedback we have received, especially at the governmental level. Uh, next slides. So I conclude uh, emphasizing that the right to pub project operates in a context that is uh, legally fragmented and very fragile. But uh, through this project, we have realized that uh, it's crucial to adopt uh, a comprehensive strategy that addresses several key areas, so regulations, training, and support. And particularly, we have, uh, we believe, we strongly believe it, how essential it is to actively involve authors in managing their rights, enabling them to feel empowered and to make informed choices. Uh, but training is not only important for scientific community, but also for legal and ethical experts. Uh, who need a, a targeted training on open access and open science to offer effective guidance and above all uh, governance bodies require the necessary support to design and implement institutional strategy promoting open access. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing that um, very comprehensive national approach also to understand uh, this 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 complex area. Um, we are now going to our last speaker before the panel, and that's Moitza Kotar. Uh, she is the Assistant Secretary General of the University Office for Library Activities at, at the University of Ljubljana. Um, Moitza has participated in establishing the national open access infrastructure with open science uh, Slovenia portal and institutional repositories in 2013. She was a member of a working group that prepared the draft national open access strategy uh, between 2015 and 20 with the respective draft action plan and a draft decree on performing scientific research according to the principles of open science, which came out in 2022. She works as a support for libraries and open science at the rectorate at the university which includes the repository, um, and she also acts as the Open Air National Open Access Desk. Over to you, Moisa. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Vanessa, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for the invitation to Spark and to all the participants to come today. So, Slovenia is a really small country uh, with 2 million people only. 
and we tend to do things nationally. So we have a national library catalog for all types of libraries. Uh, we have a national CRIS for all Slovenian research performing organizations, which is also used by the Slovenian Research and Innovation Agency as the main funder. And as Vanessa mentioned, uh, in 2013, uh, we established the National Open Access Infrastructure, which contains of the portal and six repositories using the same national software. So the buzzword here is national. <laughs> And um, open science, um, there is a really strong legal background on open science in Slovenia, which also includes copyright. Uh, today, I will present to you two Slovenian acts uh, that contain provisions on the rights retention, uh, relate, they are related to research, so the Research Act and uh, the Decree on Open Science. Um, so, Clara, if I can have the next slide, please. So, this is uh, the act. Um, uh, this act uh, has uh, three articles on open science, uh, but for the purpose uh, of the event today, uh, I have copied here Article 41, which says that um, researchers or the research performing orga organization that depends on who is the copyright holder uh, needs to retain uh, the appropriate level of rights to exercise open access to all peer-reviewed publications and to research data and other research results, the later two means if there is copyright in there. So uh, the next slide, please. This is the decree with a terribly long name, <laughs> a bit difficult to understand in English. Uh, we just call it also nationally the decree on open science. Uh, it contains, uh, it has two articles on copyright management. Article six is on copyright uh, over uh, scienti in scientific publications and article seven on copyright uh, in research data and other types of research results. Um, they are mirrored. Uh, so you will see uh, the same paragraphs in both articles. So in article six, the first paragraph says that um, Copyright can only be transferred to third parties on non-exclusive basis. Uh, and uh, Article 2, that um, scientific publications have to be published under an open license, and the two licenses are prescribed here. So the Creative Commons Attribution License uh, or Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike License. This also means that Basically, we do uh, use Creative Commons licenses, but uh, it can be equivalent system of licenses as well. So the next slide, please. Um, the, fourth the fourth paragraph of this article on copyright uh, in scientific publications allows that longer texts like monographs uh, can be published uh, open access uh, under um, more closed licenses, uh, either the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial License or the Non-Derivatives License. And the next slide uh, has information about Article 7, uh, basically the same text, but now it applies to research data and other research results. So when there is copyright in research data and other research results, um, the copyright holders are only allowed to um, transfer copyright to third parties under a non-exclusive basis. And again, the allowed uh, open uh, access, open licenses are the same as in publications. So it's the Creative Commons Attribution License or the Creative Commons Share Alike Licenses. Um, next, please. Um, so this is it, yeah. These are the two acts. Um, really important that this is in legislation. Um, uh, this is in legislations, but uh, researchers don't really exercise this. Uh, so this is uh, the work that we still need to do to train them uh, how to exercise their rights. And um, we can do this uh, via an activity um, from the Action Plan for Open Science. This is an action plan for the activity uh, from the National Resolution on Research and Innovation until 2030. And there is funding available to establish professional support also for copyright, where we could also advise researchers and train them on how to retain the rights. And that's it. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much indeed for sharing um sharing that um, very hopeful uh, pathway forward with the, the two 
uh, legislations. But as you say, uh, are the researchers exercising those rights and how do you get them to take that action? Um, but we're now going to move to the panel discussion. Um, should we just um, leave the slides for now, John, and um, just come back? Yeah, I think it's, room. It's yes, probably, I think that's probably best for the discussion. Probably easier. There was a question for uh, Moitza in the chat, Vanessa. I don't know if it makes sense to address that first. Um, yes. From Christoph Bruch, I think, Brook has asked, what's the legal basis for obliging authors? I take it that that's about obliging authors to make their materials open access. Um, Wait, so are you able just to say a little bit more um, about the... the... Yeah, um, these provisions... Um, uh, have to be uh, taken into account um, by recipients of public funding for research projects um, when it is 50% or more. Um, so this is part of uh, project calls. If I don't know if this is the, the answer um, that uh, is satisfying. Yeah. Chris, so it's you, not, if... yeah. Uh, basically, all the authors uh, in Slovenia can do this, but um, those that have to do should have should do this are the ones receiving public funding in 50 or more percent mm -hmm. okay Christoph, if that's answered your question brilliant if uh, not feel free to add yes thank you very much um, um very interesting to hear about that um, um i just thought about how backward we are in this respect in <laughs> germany um, <laughs> because our understanding of uh, academic freedom would not usually allow that um, but um, of course, there are options um, as part of the obligations um, which are attached um, to special research project funding. So that's part of your, of, or that's your answer. But besides that, um, what is about the research that is performed um, by um, researchers employed at the universities um, if they do research outside? Um, third party funding, would they also be obliged by the law um, to make their works available? Mm -hmm. uh, here, third party um, means uh, publishers. No, I'm no, not... no, no. With third party, I mean, um, mm -hmm. uh, I understand we're talking about two cases. One case is someone is rece receiving um, uh, funding, special extra funding for a research project. And as part of the obligations attached to that money is the op open access publication. That is uh, one case, one group of cases. The second group of cases would be researchers employed by a research institution or a university that do not receive a special project funding. Uh, would they be obliged to make their um, findings open access or is it up to them? No, uh, they are not obliged because there is there is no public funding. But if they are employed at the University of Ljubljana, uh, we have a strategy 2022 until 27, uh, which uh, asks um, uh, all researchers, uh, higher education teachers to publish open access in order to have um, in 2027, 90% of uh, scientific publications um, uh, deposited and publicly available via the repository of the University of Ljubljana. So uh, those researchers at the University of Ljubljana that have uh, public funding do this anyway, and the others, uh, we ask them to, to, to comply with uh, the University of Ljubljana regulations. Thank you. Great, and actually, Moit, so there is another question just coming for you from Isabel. Holoate, holo, holo, yeah. Holoate. Uh, yeah. Okay. No, uh, let me read it for okay. anyone that can't mm -hmm. see it. So, um, uh, Isabel's asking, how have Slovenian publishers responded to such strong governmental direction? Is there any impact on researchers wanting to publish with large publishers? Mm -hmm. um, I guess we are very happy in Slovenia with the major funder, the Slovenian Research and Innovation Agency, which not only funds research, but also um, subscriptions uh, to big deals uh, with uh, publishers. Uh, it is also refunding uh, APCs paid uh, to um, in the wild, let's say, uh, to publishers with which we have no agreements. And it also funds national, co-funds a national um, scientific publication. So about 145 journals, national scientific journals are co-funded or basically 
in major part funded by the Slovenian Research and Innovation Agency. And this agency asks them, if you want to be funded by us, you have to publish Diamond Open Access. So all Slovenian scientific journals receiving co-funding by the Slovenian Research and Innovation Agency are Diamond Open Access journals. So this is for the Slovenian journals. And the big five, okay. So far, <laughs> we are using APC vouchers because we have contracts with the big five uh, read and publish contracts, uh, which basically have enough APCs for the year for the consortium of Slovenian universities, uh, institutes, and hospitals. But sometimes it um, uh, there's not enough APC vouchers. And then there is the decision of the author, the corresponding author, to publish open access, pay the APC, and be refunded by the Slovenian agency. Thank you. That's very helpful. And uh, Ross has also put Ross has also put a comment in, in response to clarify some of that. So thank you. Yeah. For that. yeah so uh, Ross is basically confirming. Um, yeah. What um, the, what I just uh, explained. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, I think that's the specific questions in there uh, that I can see. So please add any other questions that you have for um, any individuals or the panel. Perhaps I can start by asking uh, the speakers. Um, uh, we've got a few things that we wanted to talk about, but maybe I'll start by asking about the importance of the collaborative element of the initiatives that everyone's been talking about. So Sarah, if I can just come back to you um, to start with, and you talked you talked about the N8, but maybe I could ask you just to, to explain how important was it that you were developing the rights retention approach in conjunction with seven other organisations? Yeah, yeah. thanks for the question, John. I think for, for us at York, I think it was really important. I don't think we'd have done it as quickly without that security of having everyone else in the club also on the same trajectory. Um, I mentioned that York is not the biggest of institutions um, in the UK and, and in our region even. Um, and there can be some nervousness to, to, uh, to, <laughs> to do things first. Uh, and also uh, quite, a, as you, I think, alluded to earlier, John, there's, there's a sense of, um, potentially being at a disadvantage if we if we do some things um, out of line with, um, with what our peers and competitors are doing. So it's a very interesting dynamic, I think, but the fact that we were able to go to our uh, Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and talk to senior um, leaders saying this, you know, we've developed this approach in line with our peer institutions within the consortia, everybody's doing it, it was a much easier sell. So when we came to present that policy at the University Research Committee, you know, it met with very little, if any, resistance. If I'm honest, I had, you know, quite an easy yeah. ride. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I know from conversations with you that it was started across the library group of the NA institutions, and then they were able to access legal expertise within institutions and work with pro vice chancellors and other support teams. So across the institutions, very similar people, and they're drawing on expertise for other places. And I mentioned that because I just now want to ask Ginevra. Ginevra, you within Rights Pub have got um, a few different parts of CNR, if I'm correct, but also the Creative Commons from Italy involved. Would you mind talking a little bit about the why was it those people who came together? What was the logic of that collaboration? Uh, yes, uh, first of all, my institute is the institutional body, uh, a member of the Creative Commons in Italy. So this is the liaison. But of course, um, we, we were very happy to submit this uh, project to knowledge rights uh, with the Creative Commons uh, ch Italian chapter and with the, the people that work on this subject. So the, the CNR library in Bologna and Pisa, but also we have uh, involved in this project uh, all these uh, other, other associations uh, that in Italy are well known uh, because um, I can say that I uh, I gave uh, you a very um, not not very good uh, picture of Italy, but of course there are many many 
association, many um, library association, but also research association that push uh, to uh, to open science uh, and um, and there are many initiatives on this field uh, to to um, create uh, um, an opportunity to reform the legislation. Uh, I, I just would like to uh, underline also um, that uh, I strongly believe that uh, um, there is uh, there is no way to to um, to speak about an obligation, but to say to to speak about a right. So a right of republication. When I see when I I, wrote, I read these uh, um, questions about uh, how to oblige or why you oblige, there is a legal base of obligation. There is no illegal basis of obligation. The right of republication is a genuine inherent right of the author and not uh, uh, of any affiliated institution. Uh, so it encompasses uh, both economic and moral rights. So uh, this uh, is a, a real a legal right, and is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, we, we can say that it's not just a right of republication, but it's a right of open publication. So uh, when I, I hear about uh, obligation exception, I, I quite smile because for me, personally and also for the community of, of the project right to pub is a real right so also philosophically this reflects an aspect of the public use of reason so uh, legally and constitutionally it aligns with the freedom of expression freedom of research and teaching and so mm -hmm. the human right to science so yeah thank it, you Jeanette. yes <laughs> no and i was just going to emphasize you know you that I, I understand enough about what you're saying there about the technical nature of the right, but the importance of your involvement in this initiative as somebody who's heavily involved in expertise around copyright and the topics you're talking is critical in Italy because of the nature of the legislative perspective that you talked about and the nature of the different um, uh, attempts to reform it that have been made, and it's a critical strand in right to pub. So it wouldn't have made sense for your colleagues, who I know have been heavily involved, that were in libraries that have been involved in developing training for researchers. They needed your involvement precisely because of that complexity within the perspective. And um, Moitse, maybe I could ask you, um, you, you mentioned, um, you talked about uh, University of Ljubljana and the work you're doing to bring the national legislative framework into your own policy environment. There is an initiative that you're involved in with about, I think, 20 or so other universities across the country or research institutions. Yeah. I wonder if you wouldn't mind talking about that as well, because I think mm. that's got a really interesting, it's a comparison to how different approaches work. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, John, for mentioning this. Um, as I said, there is really strong uh, legal background, uh, actually requirements for open science in Slovenia, and somebody has to help researchers to comply with this. Uh, luckily, uh, the Slovenian Ministry for uh, Higher Education, Science and Innovation decided when it was the time for this to plan uh, the um, resilience, uh, what's this uh, expression? Um, recovering resilience funding. Um, you know, mm -hmm. each country had these plans uh, for digitization of um, education and science. And in this part, uh, the uh, digitization of science, 25 million euros were uh, planned. Um, okay, I will not go into details uh, here, but 4 million uh, were planned uh, for a consortium of public research organizations uh, to help them um, transform their processes um, according to the principles of open science. So now we have a three-year project going on. Uh, the first year has passed already um, uh, with uh, 20 public research organizations out of 23 in the country. So these are all universities and all major institutes in here. And um, yeah, the requirement is that we align our um, legal um, fr legal frameworks of uh, participating institutions uh, with national framework, and the University of Ljubljana did this already. So the same obligations that are valid for uh, public national public funding, national uh, research funding, are valid uh, within the University of Ljubljana. Right. And Thank also, uh, there is funding to employ data stewards. So the University of Ljubljana has employed five data stewards uh, with this funding. 
Okay, so I'm interpreting this. It's, uh, it's a really important initiative to take forward the work that's been done around rights retention, but it's broader than rights retention. Yeah. It's it's a, there's more things going on within that initiative across the institution. Could I just ask something just for clarification? That uh, Recovery and Resilience Fund, is that EC funded or is it yes. national? It is, EC. it is basically yeah. the majority. I think it's EC funded, yeah. Mm. Yes. Okay, but the but the ministry also with its action plan has funds to help you implement this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, it's the combination. Mm. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I wonder if I could ask you then. Uh, this is a slightly different question, but about the importance of leadership in the different approaches that you're taking and the ways that uh, your individual institutions and collaborations have proceeded. How how important has it been to bring along the senior leadership of organisations or have support from those at the top of the organisation that you're in? I don't mind if anyone would like to take this question first. I, I can happily pick on somebody, but would anyone like to speak first? Why I don't guess. I... Yeah. Go on, Jennifer. I was <laughs> going to ask you anyway, so go ahead. <laughs> okay. So our project adopted a bottom-up approach, uh, focusing on uh, insights gathering directly from researcher rather than starting with organizational leadership. However, all outputs were shared with key leadership bodies, such as the Conference of University Rectors, uh, the Council of Presidents uh, of Public Research Bodies, and of course the Research uh, National Research Council, and and also it's very important uh, uh, that uh, our project and data th that we have gathered is crucial to implement the Open Science uh, Implementation Plan of the National Research Council. Uh, so we 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 hope that uh, uh, this voice of this project uh, uh, will be included in the Open Science Implementation Plan, which which will be published uh, in in few weeks so yes thank you what about um sarah would you mind talking a little bit more about how the different the leadership of different organizations in the n8 were involved yeah so all the vice chancellors uh, uh, are university bosses um were involved because they they all work together in the n8 research partnership so so they all got to discuss this. Um, my own vice chancellor um, was chairing the group of vice chancellors, which was very handy for us. So <laughs> we were able to have those discussions with him and he was fully on board. And I think it's been very influential within, within our own, own organization in particular, but also in others um, to support us through this. He really understands the need for why this policy was important. Um, um, and I would also want to acknowledge not just the leadership of, um, I think, senior leaders within our universities in the N8. I would say that there are significant leaders within the library community in the UK in particular who have been leading on this for a number of years. And John, you did mention um, some institutions earlier, so um, particularly Chris Banks at Imperial College in the UK, but then also colleagues at the University of Edinburgh who were the first to you know, introduce a policy like this um, uh, so, you know, the rest of us have very much been, um, I think, very appreciative of their efforts um, and really have made a massive difference to us being able to move on this. But yeah, institutional leadership is, is massively important and getting the ear of the right people within your own organisation, as we all know, is critical to, to ensuring that this, this can be a success. Yeah, there's a really interesting distinction between... Um, you have a collaborative initiative and that's not about somebody being the first to do it but it's critical that there is somebody taking leadership making plans moving things forwards it doesn't have to be the most significant or senior person in an institution but somebody who is uh leading the way or or, or making progress and chris bank's mm -hmm. name comes up in <laughs> i don't think she I don't think she's on this call, but often Chris is on the call and it's her name gets mentioned. But yeah, it's uh, the significance of that work was there. Can oh. I ask Moitza? Moitza, where's the leadership come from in Slovenia? Because I think, you know, Vanessa uh, alluded to it when she responded to you. There's a real significant amount of achieved already 
there are a number of initiatives now coming to support the implementation of the legal changes that have been made. Where where is the leadership been that's led to such change? It's at the ministry. Uh, ministry. The ministry, yeah, the this is the Ministry of uh, Higher Education, um, Science and Innovation, and um, the previous and the current minister fully support open science. Also, they are co-workers. So uh, it was basically the top-down approach. The mm -hmm. ministry has asked uh, legal ex uh, experts in Slovenia to help uh, with uh, wording uh, for the decree and the act on rights retention. So they don't ha didn't have that knowledge, but they really uh, relied heavily and appreciated very much the help of legal experts in Slovenia. Mm -hmm. Can can you say why I, I'm I'm paraphrasing here, but I'm guessing that if I were to ask people in lots of other countries about the um, how they have brought ministries on board or the role of ministries in development of legislation or policy. Um, lots of ministries have been involved. I'm not sure many people would say the leadership came from the minister or the ministry itself. Is there a, can you point to any, you know, can you say why um, the ministry in Slovenia has been such, so in favour um, or so? Yeah, um, this is uh, luckily going on at least until 2014, which means support first for open access and then for open science with data management mm -hmm. as well. Uh, it seems to me that the ministry in Slovenia always took the European research area very seriously. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, this area means that um, research systems in EU member states uh, and uh, at the European Commission are aligned. So already the national um, strategy for open access uh, in Slovenia 2015 until 2020 was fully aligned with Horizon Europe. And mm -hmm. uh, the current legislation that we have is fully aligned with Horizon uh, Europe. So the previous one with Horizon 2020 and the, the now with Horizon Europe. So this is it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's alignment with the European research area. Yep. No, thank you. And and Ross has put into the commentary that the, um, the French Ministry of Higher Education Research is pretty progressive, in his opinion. I think in, I think that's absolutely right. The French Ministry is very progressive. And I, I didn't mean to suggest that no other ministries were progressive, but I think lots of people would be interested to understand how the ministry has been the leader rather than been heavily engaged in developing it. But the French are another great example. Uh, I think that the, uh, the same as in uh, France with Marin de Cos, we are also very happy with people employed at the ministry. So it's not yeah. really if minister supports, but also people that work on this topic need to be um, dedicated and they are very dedicated. Yeah. Actually, that makes me wonder another thing that occurred to me when everybody's speaking. Um, Sarah, you talked a little bit, well, you talked quite a bit about how much importance the role of Edinburgh and other institutions you, had influenced the way that the NA and others in the UK did it. Have you, Sarah, or you, Ginevra, um, or more to be on the EU, have you been heavily influenced or looked to developments in other countries to affect the approach you've been taking? Or have you been you know, largely looking nationally at the opportunities or the national legal framework. I don't know, this is not a topic that I've discussed with you, so apologies for putting you on the spot. I'm just interested whether, uh, Ginevra, you, you looked internationally at legislative reform or... Unfortunately um, not, because Italy is a, is a very, very um, specific uh, country in this yeah. field, also because uh, uh, of the evaluation uh, um, exercise in Italy. So the assessment research. Uh, oh, yes. uh, so this is a very big uh, factor that influence our approach because there is no uh, incentive to um, publish in open access. So the lack of evaluation policy incentive is very is a very big issue. And I don't know if in other countries it's like that. Uh, so um, researchers are not motivated to publish uh, mm. in, uh, in, in open access. And this is uh, the, the big issues that uh, maybe characterize the, the Italian um, landscape. Of course, France, uh, and Spain, uh, we 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 all, all, always look at 
France and Spain, for example, for the guide, we have uh, been inspired by, by France because uh, they have done a very, very good job <laughs> uh, on, um, on the awareness of, uh, of these uh, matters to, to researchers and citizens in general. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, again, I'm right in the UK, so I'm not used to uh, everyone's having such strong praise for France. It's not really weird. Uh, uh, but uh, otherwise, Sarah, is there any any specific international influence on the way you've done it? Or have you sought um, advice or input from anyone? I don't think we have. I, I would say, though, that uh, we have, um, like you never mentioned, heavily influenced by um if climates of research funders and also our national yeah, uh, yeah. research assessment exercise but on the on the requirements of research funders i think i really noticed the kind of shift in impetus to um, rights retention um when they when our funders started to adopt um coalition s uh, uh plan s um requirements yeah. for immediate open access um and retaining you know authors and and, and for publication to be under a cc by license Sure. And I think looking back, I think that that's been pivotal in, in accelerating a lot of this development. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we've got a question in the chat from Ross, which um, is directed mostly at the Geneva or Moitza. Um, are there any individual researchers in Italy or Slovenia who are advocates for rights retention? And he he's, uh, uses Stephen Eglin in the UK as as an example of somebody who who is, uh, you know, the kind of person he's talking about. Is there anyone playing that kind of role, Geneva or Moitza? There is an association in Italy that is very, very um, pushing up for legislation and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's promoting open access, which is called AISA. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's an association for open science, uh, and the director uh, is uh, is a person. I can I can send you the, the the contact here if you want. So it's an association with of researchers and librarians, uh, very active, uh, mm -hmm. uh, also at the legislative level. So we have also uh, promote uh, bills. Um, at the, the parliament, so they don't just uh, 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 share ideas, but they concretely uh, move um, for a reform. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank yes, you. Exactly. Um, Moitse, Moitse, you were shaking. Uh, <laughs> put the link to the organisation in the chat. Moitse, you were shaking your head, exactly. so I'm taking that. Yeah. Uh, um, well, we have this strong possibility, legal possibility to exercise uh, rights retention, but there are no uh, no good advocates actually because <laughs> we mm. also have good uh, conditions for with APC vouchers and refunding of paid APCs. So this uh, is still um, not uh, widely practiced. Maybe I would only like to add that Slovenia was very much influenced by the European Commission regarding all provisions mm -hmm. on open science. And there was one really concrete reason for this. Uh, we want to have researchers uh, the least possible additional work with open science practices. And this is possible if uh, national provisions are aligned with uh, provisions of the second most important funder, which is the European Commission. So that was the reason that why Slovenia was very much influenced by the Commission of Provisions on Open mm -hmm. Science. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We've got a couple of other questions in the chat before I uh, exercise my right to ask you one more question. Um, so Pablo de Castro has asked um, what your opinions are as to how much influence Coalition S has had in putting rights retention on the radar. Um, Slovenian RS is a member, among others. Would anyone like to respond on that? I can only say that uh, the Slovenian Research and Innovation Agency is uh, listening to the coalition as very much, uh, mm -hmm. participating in its activities strongly. Yeah. I can say right. that the Italian doesn't uh, is is composed by just by one member, which is the Institute mm -hmm. of Physical uh, Physics, National Physics, and so uh, this this the Plan S and in general coalition S. Um, has not a very um, great impact in in Italy, unfortunately. I can say um, myself from the phase one of uh, retain that we did that um, 
I think almost everybody that I spoke to in that phase who was considering or thinking about developing a rights retention policy in an institution, wherever they were, was at least in part due to Plan S and that Plan S had put it on the radar, irrespective of who were members, but people were considering it because their researchers had been, the the obligation to include Plan S language had come to people's attention and, and, and making sure that researchers understood that and supporting them in it was a major factor in many institutions across many European jurisdictions in doing that. So it's definitely been the significant development that we came across in that phase of research that put it on the radar of different institutions across Europe when we're specifically talking about rights retention policies being produced. And then a final question from Robbie Morrison is, does anyone have any examples of use of CC by 4.0 going wrong? going wrong, I think is probably an inverted commas there because probably then followed it up by saying, I ask because he wonders exactly what downsides there are precisely. Does anyone have any examples of CC by 4.0 going wrong? No, no one's got any concrete examples that's shaking heads. So um, let me, I'm conscious of time and I want to head back to Vanessa just before we finish. Let me ask each of you, uh, if you wouldn't mind for a second, to to just say what happens next. So we've talked about um, work that's gone on over the last two or three years um, and and you've referred to, Vanessa has talked about the year one of a three-year programme, but just out uh, for for the next steps within your, Sarah, or for, for Right to Pub, Denevra and Moitza, what happens next? Just what is it you expect? How the work that's been done so far will develop in future, or what will be the next uh, thing to happen in this space uh, within each of your countries? Geneva, would you like to go first? Uh, yes, um, we we have elaborated a collective initiative to support the free sharing of knowledge, which is a, which is a declaration of intent, uh, which has promoted by Creative Commons, uh, the Association of uh, of, Sci- of um, Open Science, the Open Education in Italy, Wikimedia. And so this mm-hmm. uh, declaration of intent collects recommendation uh, ranging from uh, legislative changes uh, uh, to secure authors' uh, uh, rights for a publication, for promoting also open educational resources. Uh, and uh, the goal is to engage uh, even more institution and policymakers. Uh, and we have also um, put this initiative online so it can be uh, signed and is supported by now by the Council of President of Public Research Bodies. So we we hope that uh, this uh, initiative uh, will be a step uh, to push uh, for um, a a reform, a legislative reform. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Maybe I could ask you next, Sarah, you talked about um, some fairly significant changes that you are going to make over the next uh, year. Maybe I could just say, you know, within the N8, what's the the likelihood of further collaboration or people taking things forwards? And to what extent does the decision you've made on uh, transformative agreements mean? Are you are you thinking about the rights retention policy and changing it in any way, reviewing that? What what happens next there? We'll, we'll definitely need to continue to monitor our the um, impact and uptake of our policy over the next year, you know, as we withdraw from these agreements, um, it'd be very interesting to see, you know, is the data telling us that um, more people are opting out of it? You know, are there concerns, are there pressures being put on them by publishers? You know, what exactly is going on there? So I think there'll be a lot for us to keep an eye on and to monitor. Because as I, as I mentioned, I am quite concerned that some publishers may seek to, really start to undermine um our policy they're aware of our policy they shouldn't be doing this but that you know when an author's submitting we don't have oversight of what what messages are take uh, you know passing between the between the author and the publisher unless the unless the author comes to tell us so so yeah um a little bit of concern there um i think we're pinning our hopes on um more equitable um, and affordable deals being um, negotiated in the future after 2025 that mean we can we can participate in those national agreements in the future once again and that it won't be such a stumbling block for us as we're going to have at York next year but we'll wait to see. 
Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and right, so what's the, uh, is, is there any significant steps coming over the next, um, in the in the immediate future? Mm. With yeah, in? generally regarding open science, um, for the next two years, uh, we are, we will be preoccupied by, uh, with aligning uh, the processes at uh, public uh, research organizations uh, with uh, principles of open science. But regarding uh, rights retention, we need to uh, raise awareness and we need to train researchers how to do this. All right. And uh, I know those are not insignificant things to achieve. So uh, wish you well. So thank you very much, everyone, for the panel discussion. Uh, and Vanessa, I don't know if you want to say something just to finish up, but thank you so much to, to with coming and spending so much time with us. Yes, thank you very much, John, for uh for hosting that panel thank you very much um for all of the speakers for sharing so much with us um also thank you to andrea and clara in the background um so here's some more information if you would like to follow the retain and rights retention um activities uh we also have a community of practice launching in january can we go to the next slide there we are um so we really uh, welcome you to that event where we will be exploring with you um, what kind of themes should we be um, discussing and planning for for next year. So please do join us if you can. Um, I think before I finish, I'd just like to um, summarize a bit of what I heard. Um, we heard about um, some top-down solutions, some fantastic acts and decrees but there are there are challenges with researchers not necessarily exercising those rights so the need to train them up and to collaborate although the resources are there so that that we heard from slovenia um the importance of research as we heard from italy and from ginevra um really also spending time to understand what the perceptions are of the researchers and the understanding ar around this, raising awareness. I think that's really important, not just for researchers, but for those uh, who who want legislative and non-legislative um, change. So giving a voice to the research community um, because they are the ones who uh, we want to mobilize for change. Um, so advocacy is really important. And then, of course, we went, we went to York um, looking at the institution and the, uh, the power of many institutions coming together to create a joint statement that they um, align on, to come up with joint resources. So um, safety in numbers, um, having resources together that they can share um, going forward on that journey. Um, I also really liked seeing how uh, we heard about uh, one, uh, so uh, York University, uh, that you're reviewing your policy and what impact has it had. Thank you very much for sharing some of those uh, concerning developments and we will uh, see how that moves forward. I hope that the N8 will be mobilizing at themselves net as we speak to try to prevent some of that uh, action and that the vice rectors um, get prepared for any concerning um, uh, changes from some of the larger publishers. Let's hope that that doesn't take hold. Um, so we've heard uh, lots of really interesting things today, many different approaches. Uh, we chose them intentionally um, differently. Um, do look forward to more. We will have a, a, another webinar next year, early next year. We've got the report coming out next year. We've got the community of practice, so please do join us. Um, and um, we know that this will take time, but thank you so much for uh, joining us and do share your experiences with us by coming to our community of practice if you can, uh, either this year or next year. So thank you again um, for attending. Thank you all, bye-bye. <laughs>